morning, everyone. Welcome to this session of Activist Anonymous. <laughs> My name is PJ Thumb, and I am a revisionist historian. <laughs> it's interesting you applaud for that, because the, uh, the title revisionist historian was bestowed on me, of course, bestowed on me. And uh, in, it, it was meant to be in a very negative, pejorative sense, right? What is a negative, sorry, what is a, a revisionist historian? What, what do we do? Why has it been bestowed on me? Why do people, especially some people in power, feel the need to tag that label on me? Well, we're going to kind of explore that today. The world around us is shaped by stories by assumptions, by values, by narratives, perspectives, viewpoints. And this in itself is not a bad thing. The world is a complex place and our brains can only take so much at any one point in time. So we use shortcuts to think about the world, right? If someone will say to me, there's an Indonesian man outside here to see you, I can just walk outside, go, apa kaba apa, shake his hand, touch my heart. I don't need to walk outside and start thinking, oh wait, Indonesia has 737 languages. What, what, what language do I speak? And, you know, Indonesia is only 87% Muslim and 48% Javanese. What, what kind of customs do I use? Right? So these sort of mental shortcuts do help us make sense of the world and think, of, you know, react without needing to actively think because most of the time, they make sense. But, a lot of the time, they don't. And what happens when these assumptions are wrong? What happens if they are flawed? What happens if they actually hurt people? So, let me give you a few examples about um, assumptions, right, which might actually hurt people. And the first, oh, sorry. The first <laughs> is the traditional family or marriage. What is a traditional family? People today use it to describe a sort of domestic arrangement of one man, one woman in a stable, long-term, contractual relationship with children. The man is more likely to work, the woman's more likely to stay at home and raise the, and take care of the children. But for most of human history, this arrangement was just one of many different domestic arrangements. The dominance of this specific arrangement is because of the Industrial Revolution and subsequent unleashing of financial and economic forces, which unlocked productivity, which raised incomes, which lengthened lifespans, so that, well, throughout the Western world in particular, so that you could have long lives, to have stable, long term partnerships, to have division of labor and specializations, right? And also we know that until recently in Asian societies, men had multiple wives, they had concubines. Women were property, not human beings. So if you think about it, go and look at marriage ceremonies, traditional marriage ceremonies. We don't think too closely about them, but why is there a bride price? Why is there... Um, a dowry. Why does the father walk the bride down the aisle and give the bride away? Why does the bride wear white? Because the modern um, marriage ceremony evolved out of an economic transaction where the wife is sold, sold to another family. But if we accept things like the traditional family and marriage unthinkingly, then we unthinkingly also accept the subjugation of women. We reject other valid forms of domestic arrangement. Let's take a look at another example. Race, of course, is another recent invention, another very modern social construct. None of these categories existed among our peoples until Western imperialism made a need to define ourselves collectively in the face of Western imperialism. And in the Singapore context, specifically, all three categories were invented, were imposed for the purposes of a census, for the purposes of tax, for the purposes of control by the colonial power. And of course, 
Malay is the most politicized of the three terms today. Historically, sociologically, Malay refers to the entire archipelago, right? From the Philippines to East Timor to Aceh to Patani. We are all Malay. So many people then talk about, well, this is how Malaysia refers to Malays, which is a political definition, but many people don't even get that definition correct. How many of you here identify as Malay? Cool. So, in Malaysia, in Article 160 of their constitution, there are three criteria for being Malay, right? And two are obvious. One is that you need to be um, a Muslim. Another is that you need to habitually speak the Malay language. But does anyone know the third? Anyone? You want to take a guess? Go on, just guess. Feel Malay. Not quite, not quite. <laughs> but you're close. The third is that you need to um, conform to Malay custom. There is no racial component in the racial definition of Malay. Think about that. We often assume there is, but there isn't at all. Right? The only other criteria is that you need to be descended from someone who was domiciled in Malaya, that's the Federation of Singapore, before Merdeka, right? Which again, not a racial criteria. So, next one. Asian values. Many of you have probably had this deployed against you, right? According to some people, Asian values are things like nation before community, society above self, consensus, not conflict. They say things like democracy and human rights are Western imports that Asians, we don't protest, we don't do activism, we talk it out. So I always ask these people, who are the most famous and revered Asian leaders in our history? Sun Yat-sen, a left-wing radical revolutionary? Gandhi, the man who perfected non-violent protest? Sukarno, Ho Chi Minh? Jose Rizal, every single one of them, a left-wing revolutionary. The history of Asia, if you think about it, is defined by revolution, by people who stood up and fought for their beliefs, not people who sat down and negotiated, not people who valued consensus. Even Confucius, Confucius is often credited with these ideas, but Confucius was a frustrated philosopher he never managed to hold political office or appointed office anywhere because his ideas were too radical for the kings in the Warring States period. That's why he was an itinerant teacher. If you read the Analects, he's moving around, he's talking to his students. He's not holding elected office because he was too radical for his time. He said kings have a responsibility to their people. And the kings were like, what? That's crazy. No, I don't want to talk to this guy. So the person we think of as this bastion of conservatism was a radical himself in his time. So, you see, these assumptions can be destructive because they're often deployed to keep people down, to maintain a discriminatory status quo. And I'm sure many of you have heard these assumptions deployed against you. And why do they do that? Why do people deploy them? Because people with power always seek to justify themselves holding power. And in order to do so, they create these stories in which their holding of power seems not just responsible, but is natural. It's the natural order of things. And this is as old as human history itself. The first emperor of the Roman Empire, Augustus, said, I hold power because I am the best, the first citizen, the princeps. The Byzantines used the idea of divine you know, I am emperor because I am crowned by God. Uh, the Chinese had the concept of mandate of heaven. And of course, today, petty dictators all over the world use the idea of, oh, it's the will of the people. I have won an election. Don't forget, Kim Jong-un is an elected leader as well. <laughs> so how do we push back when power is unjust? We do it by breaking down these stories and building stories of our own, stories which are more inclusive, Stories which are more accurate. Stories which reflect our own lives, our own realities. And the first step towards achieving that is to understand the stories which limit you. The hidden, unseen assumptions which shape your lives. Because if you cannot admit your own weakness, 
if you cannot admit your own ignorance, your own limitations, if you cannot break down the walls which limit and define you, then you cannot break down the walls which limit and define others. You have no right to break down the walls in which limit and define others. So the first step towards enlightenment is self-awareness, to learn to know what you don't know. So today we have three people here who are going to talk to you and they're going to tell you stories. They're a mixture of case studies and frameworks, tools to help you see the world differently. And I want you to listen to them, to think about how they are changing how you see the world. As you listen to these stories, think about if and how they change your understanding of Singapore. Think about what you knew before and how that affected how you saw the world, your values, your assumptions, and then how this new information helps you understand the world differently. I'm going to introduce them one by one, but I'm not going to do the usual, you know, this person was educated here and holds this position, because that in itself is a story. That in itself is going to shape how you see them. So I'm not going to do that. Right? If I tell you someone has a PhD, you're going to think about them very differently. If I tell you someone has an activist, you're going to think about them differently. So I'm just going to tell you their names, and then they're going to tell you a little story. So first up, we have Lo 